massive hyperinflation of the things we need and massive hyper deflation of the things we already own assets in other words uh, the values of properties and the value of stocks uh the value of bonds and and that would imply interest rates are going to go much much higher uh to see a, a deflation in bonds but i think that's what we're headed for inflation and and really uh you've already seen the inflation from for the last uh two or three four years now uh of the things we need and you're starting to see uh deflation of the things we have i mean look at foreclosures look at commercial real estate look at uh car repossessions um look at uh defaults on credit cards those are all deflationary halter opens by discussing the s dollar's decline in value particularly as measured by the u.s dollar index heuristics this index measures the dollar against a basket of other currencies but Halter is quick to point out that these currencies are also pieces of crap, as they're all fiat currencies backed by nothing tangible. In other words, it's paper versus paper, and the weakening of the dollar reflects a broader decline in confidence in fiat money in general. To provide perspective, Halter emphasizes that the value of the dollar has significantly eroded over time. He compares the current price of gold at $2,600 per ounce to the start of the century, when one dollar was worth one three hundredth of an ounce of gold. Today, a dollar is only worth one twenty-six hundredth of an ounce, showing just how much purchasing power the dollar has lost. This, Halter argues, is a clear sign of the public's diminishing confidence in the dollar, and even foreign central banks are moving away from dollars and buying gold instead. Another major theme in Halter's analysis is the mounting US national debt and the unsustainable burden of interest payments. He points out that the US has already spent over a trillion dollars on interest payments alone in this fiscal year and that number is expected to rise to $1.4 or even $1.6 trillion next year. As interest payments take up a growing share of tax revenues, it creates a dangerous financial strain that is unsustainable in the long term. Halter finds it absurd that, despite this growing debt, the Federal Reserve is contemplating lowering interest rates. Typically, when a borrower becomes riskier, interest rates go up as a risk premium. Yet the Fed seems to be doing the opposite. In Halter's view, this is unprecedented and signals that the Federal Reserve is panicking about what's to come. Halter points out an odd discrepancy in the current economic environment. While housing prices remain high and the stock market hovers near all-time highs, the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates. This has never happened before in history, and it's a clear sign that something is terribly wrong beneath the surface. He warns that the Fed's actions are masking the reality of the situation. The US economy is in deep trouble. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. It's a mirror of the dollar. The dollar is testing uh, on the USDX, which measures against, you know, it's a piece of crap versus a group of, of pieces of crap. I mean, they're all paper. So it's paper versus paper, but the dollar is weakening versus foreign currencies. Um, and obviously, if you want to look at the, you could say the price of gold is twenty six hundred dollars. Um, the better way to look at it is a dollar is one twenty six hundredth of an ounce, and at the start of the century it was one three hundredth of an ounce. So basically, it's it's the dollar. Uh, it, it's it's a a lack of confidence in the dollar, if you will. You've got even foreign central banks are exiting dollars and they're publicly buyers of gold. Um, on your initial comment about uh, rate cuts, I find it interesting that now we've already spent uh, over a trillion dollars in interest in this fiscal year. It's gonna end up at 1.1, 1.2 trillion. Next year, the number is gonna be higher, it's gonna be 1.4 to 1.6 in that neighborhood. And that number is only going to go higher. Um, if you look at that number versus tax receipts, it's heating up an ever increasing large percentage of the tax revenues. So isn't it interesting mm. that the Federal Reserve can come out and say, well, but we're lowering interest rates. When a credit gets more risky, the marketplace itself 
places higher interest rates on it, not lower rates, as a form of risk premium. So the, the Fed is doing something now that they've never, ever, ever done before. You've got housing at all-time highs or close to it. I mean, there's sectors, obviously, that are weak in real estate and commercial has crashed. But you've got the stock markets at all-time highs, yet they're going to cut rates. They've never, ever done that right. before. Um, and if it were the market moving rates, rates would generally be moving higher just as a, a risk premium or risk adjustment to the fact that there there is absolutely risk now in U.S. Treasuries. They were always considered, you know, the risk-free benchmark. They're no longer risk-free. I think uh, what is in store is the whopper of all recessions, compressions, whatever you want to call it. It is systemic. And just so your your listeners understand, we have, in the United States, we have never, ever, we've had recessions without an inverted yield curve prior, but we've never had an inverted yield curve and not gone into a recession afterwards. And generally speaking, those recessions are almost always uh, dated on a calendar once the inversion begins to uninvert. And that's where we are now. Um, in my opinion, I think we've, we're in a recession now. I think we've been in a recession probably for uh, a couple of years. I mean, you could argue that we've been literally in a recession since uh, 2008 because the financial markets the real economy could not have stood on its own without trillions of lending from the from the Fed, without uh, trillions of deficit spending. If the economy and the markets were left to their own to either stand or fall, they would have already fallen many, many years ago. You've been on life support. You would think so. Uh, that's what I was getting at when I said, you know, never before have they cut rates with markets at all time highs. This is an experiment uh, where I think the Fed is actually panicking because they know what's coming. Um, and then they're, you know, they're, they're doing what they've always done. Whenever things get bad behind the scenes, they cut rates. Um, this time you've got a facade of everything as well, but total rot behind the scenes. So. I think the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, they, they played a good game by raising interest rates uh, and, and backdoor shoving money into the system to try to keep things uh, reflated. But this, I think it's going to be a disaster when all is said and done. I mean, you could use that word stagflation. Um, I've been on the record for 10 years or more now that ultimately we would go through massive hyperinflation and massive Massive hyperinflation of the things we need and massive hyper deflation of the things we already own. Assets, in other words, uh, the values of properties, the value of stocks, uh, the value of bonds. And, and that would imply interest rates are going to go much, much higher uh, to see a, a deflation in bonds. But I think that's what we're headed for. Inflation. And, and really, uh, you've already seen. The inflation for, for the last uh, two or three, four years now uh, of the things we need. And you're starting to see uh, deflation of the things we have. I mean, look at foreclosures, look at commercial real estate, look at uh, car repossessions, um, look at uh, defaults on credit cards. Those are all deflationary. Halter doesn't mince words when he says the S is heading for the whopper of all recessions. He notes that an inverted yield curve when short-term interest rates are higher than long-term rates has always been a reliable indicator of an impending recession. The US currently has an inverted yield curve, and according to Holter, it's only a matter of time before the recession fully manifests. The problem, however, is not just a typical recession. Holter predicts that this will be a systemic collapse, one that could dwarf previous recessions. He points to the fact that as Treasuries long considered the benchmark of risk-free assets, are no longer risk-free. 
The growing national debt and reliance on credit to keep the economy running are ticking time bombs, and once confidence in the system breaks, the entire credit-based economy could come to a screeching halt. Holter believes the US is heading into a period of stagflation where inflation persists despite stagnant economic growth. He has been predicting this for over a decade, and he now believes it's happening. What's worse, Holter foresees hyperinflation of essential goods like food and energy, combined with deflation in the value of assets like real estate, stocks, and bonds. This toxic combination will wreak havoc on ordinary people's lives, as the cost of living skyrockets while their investments and assets plummet in value. Holter points to several signs that this is already happening. Foreclosures, car repossessions, and credit card defaults are all rising, which are deflationary indicators. Meanwhile, the prices of essential goods continue to soar. This, Halter argues, is the beginning of the economic disaster he has been warning about for years. Perhaps the most frightening part of Halter's analysis is his discussion of the derivatives market, which he calls the tail wagging the dog of the global financial system. He references Warren Buffett's famous description of derivatives as weapons of mass financial destruction, and he believes that these financial instruments will be at the heart of the coming collapse. I think we're already we already started to see it last month with the yen carry trade mm. starting to unwind. Um, and I mean, just because of the size of it and also the fact that you really don't you can't look at it and 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 lie, you can't look at derivatives and logically see what the total is, who's trading with who, where the weak points are. I'm just going to say broadly, this blow up is going to be derivatives. And Warren Buffett calls them uh, weapons of mass financial destruction. That's exactly what they are. It appears that the, there, we're told that uh, back in 2008, that it was overestimated when it was 1.4 quadrillion. And the real number was only 600 quadrillion. And we're told that that number is still the same, which is complete bullshit. There's no way. I mean... Uh, to see a reflation in the system without derivatives expanding, that's, you know, a ridiculous argument. The, the real numbers, in my opinion, uh, somewhere north of two quadrillion dollars. And understand that one quadrillion is more than all the assets on planet Earth. Yeah. So it's truly the tail wagging the dog. I think in a nutshell, I mean, we could talk on this subject alone probably for two hours or more. Uh, but I think in a nutshell, what it means is credit is going to cease because confidence is going to break and, and credit will not be put forth without confidence. And understand that the real economy today entirely runs on credit. Everything you do, uh, you flip a light switch, you, you turn your water on, you go to the grocery store, you buy gasoline, Whatever you do, there's credit involved. And without credit, there's nothing functions. That's what's going to happen is the real economy is basically going to cease to exist for a spell. Two weeks, two months, uh, you know, God forbid six months or more because you will see people die from, from lack of food. Uh, but once, once credit ceases, the real economy is going to basically stop. Originally, uh, derivatives, uh, I guess the original derivatives were uh, futures contracts on commodities. You had a corn farmer or wheat farmer, rice farmer, whatever, uh, selling to hedge their, their production. And you had speculators on the other side, uh, not always on the other side, Speculators would either buy thinking the price is going to go up or sell thinking the price is going to go down. So those are the original derivatives for basically the commodities markets. Mm -hmm. Then in 1976, uh, we they started in Chicago with, with options. Um, and then you had uh, futures on stocks, futures on bonds, futures, futures on everything. And in today's world, there's futures on air quality. There's futures on temperature. There's futures on everything. Uh, basically, there's bets both ways on everything, and it is a zero-sum game. So 
in, in a single contract, there's a winner and there's a loser. And the problem is when the loser loses so big that they go bankrupt, then the winner becomes a loser because he's not getting paid. And that's where everything paper becomes worth nothing. 